God bless Mother Nature. She's a single woman too. She took over heaven and she did what she had to do. She taught every angel to rearrange the sky so that each and every woman could find the perfect guy. It's raining men, hallelujah. Welcome to our sanctuary, where for the last 115 years, Auckland Unitarians have come to freely explore many questions such as, who is this God? Why did he give Mother Nature so much power? And what about those women who want to find the perfect woman? Thankfully, we have our principles on the wall up there to guide us through the next hour before the stimulating conversation that we will have at morning tea. Welcome to all our new faces. You have come at the last of an exciting series where our regular minister, Clay Nelson, takes a well-earned break and casual summer services are run by lay members, exploring our varied interests and knowledge while focusing on the principles of Unitarianism, the foundation of our community. Let me begin by defining a few words. Queer is an umbrella term I'll use relating to sexual or gender identity that does not correspond to established heterosexual norms. It is much easier for me to say that I'm queer than to say I'm a cisgendered, pansexual, polyamorous, polytheist male. <laughs> I use it in a positive, affirming way and not at all derogatory as it may have been used in the past. Divinity refers to deities, gods, supreme beings, creator spirits, and anything else regarded as sacred and holy. Things start out really well the first time humans are mentioned in the Bible. A good page or two before Adam and Eve's decline, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, states, And then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the flesh, the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, livestock, etc. Something about this tells me God is not a solo male. Verse 27 continues, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of the God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So God has suddenly become a male, or maybe the male did all the work, but still he created at least one male and one female in his or their image. Verse 28 goes on to say that they were blessed and to be fruitful and increase in number. I see these first humans as being equal, all made from the same divine source, each blessed and told to rule equally. How did this turn into a religion and a society where women are treated as second class and sex is shameful, harmful, and scary? If your dominant culture is homophobic and misogynist, ensuring that the feminine is not powerful, feminine spiritual experiences are going to be demonized and downplayed. Being such a powerfully inspiring force, there has been a need to control how it is seen and experienced. Made pure, virginal, and safe. Why do we not see a lot of queer spirituality in Western culture? We see the chiseling off or fig leaves placed over all the naughty parts. Queer people have been denied so much in modern religion, having to shut away, hide, and ignore their sexuality. Although when you think about it, being a celibate priest married to a male god is pretty queer. <laughs> Thankfully, Unitarianism has had a progressive history over the last 47 years, supporting queer ministers, marriage equality, ending discrimination, and creating welcoming congregations. My main source of research for today's talk, like any good large institute, is Facebook. So of course my data will be highly accurate and completely devoid of alternative facts. Is this working? Oh yeah, it is. Cool. Wanting to get a picture of how queer relates to the divine, I started mining my friends list for numbers. Yes, that meant all cisgendered heterosexuals were ignored. My first surprise was that 5% of my queer friends were atheist. Actually, I don't, I don't really know what I was expecting. 
I thought with religious organizations being so anti-gay, there must be more people giving up on God altogether. I also thought that boorish atheists were pretty lucky to be on my friends list at all. Being a polytheist, I had the idea that most of my other friends would be the same. So you can imagine my disappointment when I found out that 60% are monotheist, mainly of the three Abrahamic religions, leaving only 35% of them having relationships with multiple deities. In order to get a broad idea of how queer see the divine, I asked a question. When you think of God, what do you picture in your mind? Of course, the atheists saw God as an illusion created by man to exert power and influence over others, acknowledging that the God concept provides comfort and support to believers who see God as a supernatural being of guidance and judgment. Those born into the cultures of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism had more varying responses, although your Renaissance painting of a bearded man in the sky predominated. Some recalled images of a booming voice coming out of a cloud, a bearded white man watching over humanity, and others suggested the possibility of him being a drag queen, referring to him sometimes as a her. The relationship with this God in the sky seems distant, parental, and lacking connection. It doesn't take much to trigger these old traditional images, but where do they come from? Well, the Jews were first, with their male God. He was based on a fertility God. A lot of his Old Testament actions imply a younger, more fertile male figure acting out on his emotions. The Old Testament and all the talk of multiplying seed make a lot more sense when you realize the Hebrew God evolved from a more ancient phallic idol. Another view of God is as something nameless, timeless, and beyond everything we can comprehend. Often described as an energy around us all, the energy of the universe and part of every living thing. One friend's thought was Joan Osborne's song, What If God Was One of Us? What if God was one of us, just a slob like one of us, just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home? I really love the verse of this song that says, If God had a face, what would it look like? And would you want to see if seeing meant that you'd have to believe in things like heaven and in Jesus and the saints and all the prophets? My answer would be no, thank you. The same friend is a brother of the unnamed path, an emerging spiritual tradition for men who love men. His image of God has changed with his experience as he learns more about himself and the world around him. In fact, the brother's God has four aspects, a dark and a light God, a dark and a light goddess. This leads me nicely into polytheism, the idea of worshiping many gods. Looking back to a time when gods ruled the world, when multiple gods ruled the world, there was some pretty queer stuff going on. Apollo and Hyacinth were more than just friends throwing a discus. Then there's Loki transforming himself into a female horse in order to seduce a male stallion later giving birth to Odin's steed Sledmere. Then there is Thor, dressing himself up in an elaborate wedding gown in order to pass himself off as Freya and marry a storm giant who had stolen his hammer. (coughs) All at Loki's gleeful insistence, of course. Every culture's deities have had their fair share of queerness, being pansexual, transformative, or multi-gendered. How does this play out today? Are people desiring a connection between their spirituality and sexuality, seeing a reflection in the divine more like themselves? Let me relate some of my story, which begins with a scout camp on Kawao Island in the late 1980s. I would have been four or five, my brother a cub, my dad a leader, and my mother helping in the kitchen. The theme was pirates, and I had a ball. After dinner on Saturday night, the possums eating the scraps and the joeys stunned by the light of our torches, we formed a procession and headed to the campfire side. The fire lighting ceremony began with ashes from previous campfires, 
added to the kindling of the present fire. Akela, with his walking staff, called to the four directions. We sang and chanted, acted and told stories. The first of many magical campfire rituals I would attend over the, the next decade. Sunday mornings, too, had a special time put aside called Scout Zone, where music, readings, silence, and irreverence for Mother Nature was shared. I loved it, and I was hooked. Little did I, little did I know that Lord Baden Powell's scouting movement had the same roots that influenced British traditional wicca and many branches of modern paganism. My family were relatively liberal. We didn't say grace and really attended a church service. I was an avid reader. Fairy tales, Jesus morality stories, and famous people's biographies were all the same to me. I certainly had no concept of God other than a story about a man in the sky. Fast forward to 1996. I'd won prize ribbons in the, in the Bay of Plenty science fairs for my experiments in pollution and plants. I'd placed first equal in the Australasian school science competition. I'd spend my days programming computers, camping every second weekend. And I was about to go into secondary school to study calculus, physics, chemistry, and horticulture. Raymond Buckland, an initiate of Gardner and Wicker and prolific author, had written a book describing the history and practice of the Pectiwitta, a group in Scotland. I don't know why I took it home. It would have been about maybe 60 centimetres in a small library along the Dewey Decimal System from the computer programming books I always borrowed. So it probably just caught my eye. We had just had family visit from Scotland, so that may have sparked my interest. Anyway, somewhere between the pages of that book and Ted Andrews' book, Animal Speak, about shamanism, I discovered the goddess and God and replaced scouting with neo-paganism. Wicca was my religion and influenced my dress, friends, and more importantly, introduced more environmentalism, permaculture, and ethics into my study. This served me really well until the turn of the century, but it was a prescribed god and goddess. Modern Wicca was popular with women. Most pr practitioners in New Zealand and Australia were female. Circles, books, artwork, and societies became so focused on the divine feminine, the pendulum had, f had swung so far to one end of gender binary, I was at the other, and so I was out. Well, the gods were gone anyway. I still continued following male authors, visionaries, and metaphysicists like Stuart Wilde and Richard Templer, practicing their teachings, but it was like having a perfect china bowl and a silver spoon, but nothing to eat. I was hungry, and although wealthy, educated, and successful, life kind of sucked. If you asked me what God looked like in 2006, I would have said, mm, a universal spirit, connected to the human spirit, something doist maybe, but very clinical. A few years later, I was invited to teach Panurithmi, a spiritual dance practice of the Universal White Brotherhood, an obscure branch of Christians who embrace music, dance, meditation, yoga, and vegetarianism. Kind of the Hare Krishnas of Christians. I was a singer and a dancer, having picked it up when I left school and enjoyed helping teach in the Bay of Plenty and up north. Three things happened during those few months. Firstly, when it came to dancing, after failing at rehearsals and during the actual run through of the dance, Things ran smoothly, beyond belief. Secondly, I experienced for the first time in my life seeing the divine spark in another person. And thirdly, I reconnected with my family's spiritual home up north. I had rediscovered my spirituality, but it wasn't to be with the brotherhood. It was where I had left it in my heart. All I needed was the systems, structures, and discipline to bring it out. I began searching for a school or organisation to fill this need. Sadly, the schools of Wicker and Auckland either suffered the restraints of gender binary, only admitting heterosexual couples, or they were too far to travel to or lacked any substance belonging a one-year's degree. 
Any neo-pagan groups are either mainly social groups or couldn't organise their way out of a paper bag. <laughs> Lucky for me, I found organisations in the USA to meet my needs. The books that I once ignored in the mid noughties for mentioning goddess and god were now my texts, but this time it was different. Now I don't accept the prescribed gods, but instead approach everything with scepticism, allowing my experiences to shape my view, not other people's view. Every morning, I invite the goddess, God, and great spirit to join me in my day, to help all lessons come with ease and grace, and I give gratitude for the abundance in my life, that all my needs are met, and more. The great spirit I perceive as an energy or light, often split up to the full spectrum of the rainbow. The goddess and God are symbolized in ritual as the black and white candles that you see on the chalice table today. My relationship with them is sometimes parental, a feeling of unconditional love, and maybe an image of Harry Potter's parents. Other times they're very archetypal, more ancient, like columns dressed in silver and gold. Over time, through meditation and ritual, I've built up relationships with two other gods, Ganesha and Venus. Ganesha is very queer, a male with both a phallic trunk and breasts. Like me, he is very handy, having two sets of arms. He has a healthy, competitive relationship with his brother, a sense of humour, and he doesn't let a broken tusk get in his way. Whenever I have barriers, Ganesha is the god I petition to. Venus is a bit harder to describe, symbolised here as a flower and a rose-scented candle. Venus's traits encompass love, music, beauty, desire, fertility, prosperity, and victory. Divine relationships are like other sorts of relationships. They come and they go and they change. They evolve and develop, grow, end, and begin anew. It is about opening ourselves to those possibilities and being open to experiencing them. I'd like to share a concept of the divine with you today called the diamond of divinity. That's in your order of service. The image on the lower right side is the logo of the Interfaith Church of Australia. If you look at it metaphorically, a Christian looking at the diamond would see a Christian God. A Buddhist or pagan looking at the same diamond would see different facets, their own experience of God. But they're all looking at the same thing. The neo-pagan version on the left has more archetypal versions of gods in the center and individual gods on the outside. More feminine on the left and masculine on the right. Gods of the upper world above, the lower worlds below. This is helpful when exploring the differences between different cultures' deities. When I'm sitting with friends or family who see God as a stunning view or sunset ahead, I often consider at the light radiating from the diamond rather than the diamond itself. It is a metaphor, but I think it is good to consider in your connections with people of other religions. Back to Facebook and my question of what God looks like. The first person that answered my question was knitwear designer, Kyle Konecki, who said, I think he knits. I love this idea of God creating the fabric of the cosmos, the universe falling off his needles stitch by stitch. Knitting could become a new religion. Knitting could become an act of worship. Yarn stores and stitch and bitch sessions, the new churches. <laughs> Famous American knitter Elizabeth Zimmerman could be made a patron, patron saint and her books, the brand new testaments. Last week, while considering a pattern for a ski sweater, I stumbled across a gem. I hope you'll read between the lines and see these words not only applying to knitting, but to religion, spirituality, and all aspects of life. Knitting Without Tears, the New Bible. <laughs> Chapter 3, page 50-something.
The books don't know everything. They know a great deal, but not everything. Take anything you find in an instruction book, including this one, with a large grain of salt. If it doesn't make sense in your particular circumstances, pay no attention to it. Seek further. There are scores of different ways of doing things in knitting, and none of them are wrong, but they are sometimes unsuitable. There is no right way to knit. There is no wrong way to knit. The way to knit is the way that suits you and the way that suits the wool and the pattern and the shape that you are currently working on. Show me any mistake and I will show you that is only a misplaced pattern or an inappropriate technique. There are patterns that include drop stitches and twisted stitches. There are projects which could be as tight as you can possibly knit. There are others that you have to relax to the point of lethargy in order to make them loose enough. I've not yet found a pattern which includes a split stitch. This is the only real mistake that I know. So if anybody kindly tells you what you're doing is wrong, don't take umbrage. They mean well. Smile submissively and listen, keeping your disagreement on an entirely mental level. They may be right in this particular case, and even if not, they may drop off pieces of information which will come and very handy if you file them away carefully in your brain for future reference. For today's meditation, or it's more a contemplation, what if you were born into a different religion? I went to Facebook again, so if you turn it over, there's a flow chart for choosing your religion. So take this time to just quickly move through and see what you are prescribed and see, is it really who you are? I'm Hindu, by the way. For my closing words today, they come from UU World magazine. If you ever see me on the bus with a tear in my eye, it's probably because I'm reading this magazine. It's the beginning of an article by Chris Wilcox, an atheist, who is a prolific writer in UU World magazine. The article's called A Record of Things Wonderful. When my mother was dying in a Seattle hospital far from my home in suburban Boston, a palliative care team comprising a doctor, a social worker, and an interfaith chaplain arrived to help us understand the process of her dying and care for her in the final days. As they prepared to leave, I asked the chaplain if I could have a prayerful moment with him. The request surprised us both. I didn't know precisely what I wanted. Prayerful is not a term I ever uttered. I knew that he was an Episcopal priest who, as a chaplain, served people of all faiths as well as those who did not identify with a religion. I also felt instinctively that he could interpret my request for a prayerful moment, even if I could not. He led me to a small room 
of chairs and tissues and did his best to understand. I see your mother listed Unitarian Universalist as her religion. Yes, I see it, and it's mine too. He asked if I'd like him to say something in keeping with our faith. I struggled for words, finally coming out with, could you, could you just say whatever, a, I wish he was Methodist, say in situations like this. He put his hand on mine and prayed that God would bring comfort and peace to my mother and our family. I sniffled back my thanks and went back to mum's room. A devout Christian might say that God was reaching out to me. A confirmed atheist might suggest I was too sad to think clearly. Here's what I think. I needed comfort from the most direct source of that person's heart, which was Episcopal tradition and belief. Further, I knew that to receive comfort in the language of his faith would not cancel or threaten mine. My beliefs were safe within me. I'm often reminded of the diamond of divinity.